will probably be traveling or either have family that will be traveling to us and so it's a big week and uh, one that we need to remember each other in our prayers as we go back and forth and enjoy time uh, doing the things that, that we look forward all year to doing uh, during this week. <clears throat> We're going to talk a little bit about that this morning, and if you'd like to, I'd love for you to follow along with the version notes and uh, check those out. Also, I wanted to remind the youth group, but not just the youth group, that there's a t-shirt sign up uh, back on the youth board, and uh, I'd encourage really anybody who'd like to get one of these t-shirts, what the t-shirt, the goal of, the, of it is, on the back there's a little symbol about the gospel. On the sleeve it has 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, and so it's a shirt that hopefully will provoke uh, maybe a question or maybe maybe an opportunity for you to speak about the gospel to someone. And so I encourage you to check out those t-shirts. There will be a, a, an evangelistic tool, I think, and uh, we'd love for everyone to get one and, and uh, enjoy using those to teach others about the gospel of Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and the resurrection. So check those out on the youth board and please sign up. We need you to sign up today and uh, <clears throat> we'd, we'd love to have a, a lot of us to enjoy having those shirts and use those in the community and everywhere that we go. So you are what you eat, and uh, not really the lesson you were hoping for right before Thanksgiving, I understand that, but you are what you eat. Many extremely significant uh, moments in Scripture take place over a shared meal. Have you ever noticed that? Uh, as you go through the Scriptures, lots of times some of the most impactful, important lessons are actually taught over a meal. Eating together is a bonding experience, and, and throughout history, mankind's always considered eating together as something special. How many of the most significant moments in your life can you think of that occurred over a meal? Some of our precious memories of people that we love and, and people who have invested so much into our lives, we think of those times that we were with them over a meal. Maybe even this week when we think about Thanksgiving, Precious memories that we cherish, that we love to remember those precious people. Well, in John chapter 6, we find a story of a meal, and this is a meal with Jesus that was really, really crowded. Uh, there were thousands of people at this event, and they all felt a connection to Jesus because of what he did, and it was a moment in time, a meal that none of these people would ever forget. John says that there was more than 5,000 men there, so including the women and children, uh, we're, we're talking about a crowd that could have exceeded 10,000 people. There's a lot of people at this meal when we go to John chapter 6, and we read there how that this hungry crowd is, is there with Jesus, and he, he looks over at Philip, and he asks him, how are we going to feed these people? And he does this kind of testing, Philip, it says, and it says then how that uh, Philip replies that it's impossible to feed all these people. But then Andrew comes forward, and he has a, a little boy. And this little boy has a lunch of five loaves of bread and two fish. And so he offers those five loaves of bread, and he offers those two fish to Jesus. Jesus prays over them. And Jesus multiplies the fish and the bread so that the entire crowd eats as much as they want and are completely filled. And the crowd's obviously amazed by what Jesus does. And the crowd then goes away. Jesus goes away. But the next day, as you keep going in John chapter 6, you'll see that they're looking for Jesus again in verse 22. Uh, they, they start looking for him again because they're hungry again, right? Right? One meal's not going to do it. They're going to be hungry again the next day. And so they start looking for the guy who was able to give them so much and, and that, that filled them up the day before. And so they start looking for him. And I want you to think about the existence that these people uh, lived under, what they had and what they didn't have. Because in our lives, we don't necessarily go day to day looking for what we're going to eat, right? We don't really have that as a stress in our life or a concern. We have plenty to eat. We, we've got anything really that we want at our fingertips. We can go and find what we, And so it's not necessarily eating that we are struggling with every single day. But these people definitely were. They were struggling with this, and so it was something that was on their mind. It was a constant concern to them, and they were hungry again the next day. So they come find Jesus, expecting to be able to get food again. But in verse 26, Jesus says, Truly I tell you, you're looking for me, not because you saw the signs that I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. 
You see, their focus was on their physical hunger, and it was blinding them to the spiritual implications of who it was that was with them, who it was that was feeding them, the precious Messiah of God who had come to redeem them of their sins, who had come to fill them spiritually into eternity. They were still just focusing on the miracle that he was able to do, which gave them food. They were concentrating on the physical rather than the spiritual. And in verse 27, Jesus says, Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life which the Son of Man will give you. You see, Jesus knows that the crowd is searching to satisfy their appetite. And Jesus uses their physical hunger as an opportunity to teach a spiritual truth. And he tells them in verse 35, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never be hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. You see, the spiritual food of his word, it will feed our soul, and it will satisfy us even to eternity. It's not a meal that, uh, as we with physical food, must continue to eat. It's a food that continually feeds us if we're treasuring it in our hearts. If we're allowing God to speak to us regularly and listening to what He said, He's going to continue to bless us through those things that we hear and that we understand from His Word. And so you are what you eat. First this morning, I'd like for us to consider what we eat determines what we hunger for. What we eat determines what we are hungering after. You see, if our diet determines our appetite physically, the same is true spiritually. Our spiritual diet determines our spiritual appetite. And and so if we're not taking much spiritually in, we're not going to be hungry for those things, are we? We're not going to necessarily want them because we don't know that we need them because we're not taking them in in the first place. Because what we're already digesting, what we're already taking in, is what we're going to then train our minds to hunger for. So are we training our minds? And am I preparing my heart that I would be open and receptive to the Word of God? Or am I preparing my heart for something else? Am I making sure that my heart is open and receptive to the, to the ideas of the producers out of Hollywood? Am I opening my mind and making sure that it's open for the the suggestions of authors of secular books that I might be reading? Am I keeping my heart open for the influence of ungodly people who I have in my life and who I spend time with? Or am I making sure that my appetite is desiring and creating a desire in me to want the Word of God? What you treasure in your heart will manifest itself in your life. In Matthew 6, 33, it says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. All these things will be added to you. And we read earlier, don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. He says, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. And this is the spiritual food that I'm talking about. What we eat determines what we hunger for. Are you hungry for the Word of God? Are you looking forward to listening and learning from the Bible and growing in the knowledge of Jesus? See, he's trying to teach both them and us that life is so much more than just the physical things that we value. Those people valued food because they recognized that their survival was based on if they found something to eat for a few days in a row, right? Because this was the life that they lived. It was a hard life. We don't have those same struggles, but we still have things like they were focusing on food that we focus on sometimes that take us take our eyes off of Jesus the physical things we value and Jesus knows it's a cycle of being hungry and being filled up being hungry and being filled up being hungry and and being filled up again just a cycle over and over and if that's our relationship to God we need to consider what Jesus is teaching If our relationship to God is only a weekly existence where we check in every Sunday and say all right Lord I'm here, thank you, and then we go back and live our lives as if the Lord actually has no contact with us through the week. He says, this isn't what it's about. He says, there's more to our relationship than that. I want more of you than just one day a week. I want more of you than just one day a year. You see, our faith isn't supposed to just be a weekly refill. It's an everyday walk with God. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 38, it says, I'm persuaded. He says, I'm convinced 
that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers or things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Does that sound like the relationship you have with God? That there's nothing that could separate you from that book, from that word of God that he's given to you, that he wants to treasure into your heart? Does that sound like your relationship with him? Something that just can't be separated, something that just must be a part of your life and that if anyone ever tried to take it from you, they just couldn't because it's so important to you and you treasure it so much. Is that the relationship you have with God? And if not, maybe we should consider that. Let me ask you something. How do you become convinced of something? How are you persuaded by something? I would say it would take repetition to convince me of something. Usually it does. It takes repetition for me to to look at something and say, okay, this is what's going to happen. When I see it happen over and over again, when I learn something over and over again, I finally understand it and I'm convinced by it and then I can walk in that knowledge. It's by following every single day, repetitiously listening and learning from God. And parents, you know, this message is especially for us. The Holy Spirit puts this responsibility squarely on our backs, and it's so important that we start very young with our children. In Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4, he says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all your soul, all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand. They'll be like frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. He says, you infuse the word of God into every aspect of your life. You make sure that your family understands that the Bible is what holds us together. The Bible is what guides us in this world. The Bible, God's word, is what's of paramount importance to our family. He says, this is how you prepare children to become adults who are godly, adults who seek Jesus, adults who seek after righteousness. You know, traditionally, at least in our home, sorry, Leanne, you see, when you, when you start down this path, you have to keep going. You, you got to finish this. And so, <clears throat> she doesn't like me to talk about her in sermons, but you know, in our house, Leanne usually makes the food, okay? And so when we're hungry, when, when any of us three, you know, get hungry, we usually look to her, right? And we think, feed me, you know? And, <clears throat> and she's, um, it's amazing. She goes into the kitchen and she comes back out and she has food and it's delicious and we survive, you know? And <clears throat> it's wonderful that she is able to prepare that for us and, and to serve that to us. And traditionally, you know, mothers provide those things. They, they cook for their families and they, they deliver. And, and, you know, we're looking forward to this, this Thursday where we're going to feast with our families. And there's certain people in our families who you know are going to bring certain dishes, right? You've got the certain aunt that's going to bring the, the uh, uh, sweet potato casserole, right? You've got a certain person who's fixing the sweet tea maybe. And maybe because you know, hey, this is what she's really good at, right? Am I right? Okay. And so we know these people are going to prepare these things for us. And we're looking forward to it. I want to tell you something. Especially us fathers. Just as much as we recognize and see it as the mother's responsibility that we're fed nutritiously and that we're sustained by delicious food, God says, fathers, you must feed them spiritually. Fathers, it's your responsibility to make sure that your family grows up knowing they're going to be sustained spiritually by the food you provide. And so at times at night, Uh, Maybe with the family, when we're sitting around and and, and it's time to praise God, every eye should turn to dad. Everyone should look at him and expectantly and knowingly know he's going to give us a Bible passage. He's going to lead us in a song. We're going to think about spiritual things because it's his responsibility to train up the family to walk with God every single day. Ephesians 6, 4, bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Fathers, don't let the TV, don't let the internet dominate time at home. Make sure you make time for family devotionals. Just as much as we depend on our precious wives to deliver that food, they depend on you to deliver the spiritual food. And never shirk the responsibility 
Because if you look around at our society, this is where we've fallen. This is where we've slipped up. The fathers aren't providing the spiritual leadership necessary, the training necessary, the nurturing spiritually for their families. If I'm not going to teach my family the spiritual truths, who is? Now, you know, it it is very rare, but sometimes I go in the kitchen and help Leanne. Yeah, I do. And I, and I help a little bit. And so it's fine. And, and the same should be true spiritually. She helps me in teaching the children. But you know what, fathers? We can't let them just have that responsibility. We can't just turn that over to the mothers. As wonderful and as spiritually minded and as amazing as they are, that's not what God instructed them to do. He told us to do it. So never shirk the responsibility Never let the TV dominate. Never let something else take your place to prepare and serve the spiritual meals in your home. You see, walking with God means that we choose the narrow road over the broad way because that broad way leads to destruction. Remember in Matthew 7, Jesus said, enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many there are that go in by it. And we see it all over our society. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life and there are few who find it. Do you think he knew that we were going to have televisions? Do you think he knew that football was going to be on? Do you think he knew that these things were going to be in between us and our family's spiritual growth and that would, would distract us from training them? I think he did. And I think that's why he's written these things to us. That we might stay on the narrow way. We've got to train them to walk with God. Train them by consistency. Help them to become convinced as you are convinced. Because the fact is, we're not doing a very good job translating that knowledge into the next generation. And that is on us. That's on each of us individually as we prepare our own homes and teach them spiritually. What we eat determines what we're hungry for. So what is your family eating when it comes to the spiritual food that they desperately need? We don't need to please our sinful flesh. In Romans 13, 14, it says, put on the Lord Jesus. Make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. But instead, we should be looking to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. And now he's set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Let's follow Jesus' example and actually live out 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 31 literally. Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Can you imagine if we led our families in such a way that they saw that being lived out every day in our lives? I doubt that we would see so many of our young people go astray. Too many of us have gotten so used to being filled with junk food, which is easy to get. It fills our lives, but it leaves us feeling empty. Watching TV is junk food. Going and and enjoying sporting events, it's fine in and of itself. But when we let it take the place of our service to God, it's junk food. It's just something that fills the place. It it fills the the, the space that's empty there, but it's just going to leave us empty the next day. We're just going to need more. We're going to need something else in the next moment. It's a cycle, a vicious cycle that will continue in our lives if we try to fill our lives with those things that really don't change anything in eternity. Yeah, they, they mean a lot to us today. But in eternity, what is it doing to our families when we're skipping church for sports? When we're hurrying off to a restaurant instead of staying at church to encourage others in the faith? To to look at someone in the eye and say, I prayed for you this week. To look someone here at church in the eye that, that needed your love. To stay and be a part of the fellowship that occurs after the worship is even over. Yeah, we should be feasting on the riches of God on His wisdom and on His love. It says in Romans 8, verse 5 and 6, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. He says you set your mind on the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Do you want life? I know you do. You want peace? I know you do. What you eat determines what you're hunger for. What you're going to continue to hunger for and what the next generation will hunger for. So what are you feeding them? 
I know we're looking forward to a wonderful meal this week. Uh, I hope that we enjoy it with giving thanks to God for it. But I hope that it's not the only meal that we're looking forward to with our family this week. Because we should be looking forward to a spiritual meal with them also. I know many families go around the, the table and they say, well, what are, what are you thankful for? And everyone tells something that they're thankful for right then and there. And fathers, that's when you step up and that's when you say, this is what we're thankful for as a family. And this is what we're going to do better in in the coming year to bring glory to God's name and to, to treasure Him instead of the world because your spiritual diet determines your spiritual appetite. And secondly, this morning, we've got to digest what we're eating and then use it in service to God. You know, the after Thanksgiving dinner nap is a wonderful, wonderful nap, isn't it? It's a wonderful nap. It's a delicious turkey and dressing, ham and cheesy potatoes and sweet potato casserole, epic coma of food that we just go into. And we slip into this wonderful sleep, but we don't stay there, do we? It's not just a few hours later, we're back in the kitchen looking for some of that ham and we, we cut some of those rolls and we start making sandwiches, right? <clears throat> God doesn't want us to just take the spiritual things that we're receiving from Him and not do anything with them. He wants us to use them. You've got to allow some time to digest the wonderful food, and we, God recognizes that. In Psalm 19, 14, He says, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. In Psalm 1, 1 through 6, He says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, but, or, nor stands in the ways of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates. He's digesting the word of God. He's meditating day and night. And what does it do for him? He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in season, whose leaf shall not wither, and whatever he does will prosper. You hear that? This is a promise from God when you bring to Him all of your concerns, all of your cares, all of your life, and you deliver it at the foot of the cross, and you say, I'm going to live to glorify you, Lord. And then you walk in His way, having taken in that spiritual food that sustains you into eternity. Don't let it end there. When you wake up from that nap, from that delicious spiritual food when you've listened to the word of God and you and you you digest those things that you've heard then you've got to go and do those things that God has taught you to do in 1 Corinthians 9 verse 19 it says though I'm free from all men I've made myself a servant to all that I might win the more to the Jews I became as a Jew that I might win those Jews to those who are under the law as if I was under the law that I might win those who are under the law to those who are without law became as one without law not being without law towards God but under law towards Christ that I might win those who are without law to the weak I became as weak that I might win the weak I have become all things to all men that I might by all means save some and this I do for the gospel's sake that I may be partaker of it with you. It says it's about the gospel. It always comes back to the gospel, doesn't it? It always comes back to the salvation that God is offering mankind because he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should, become, should come to repentance. He, he, he sent his son that all could have salvation, that all could come to him. And so when you take in the spiritual food of God, make sure that you then go out and instruct others in the good doctrine of Christ nourishing them in the words of faith of the good teaching that you have also carefully followed first Corinthians first Timothy 4 and verse 6 see our lives they're not dominated by the search for our next meal but there are many things we spend too much time and energy chasing after the whole time having known and having been sustained by the spiritual food of God and then yet refusing to go and deliver that same food provide that same spiritual food for someone else in John 6, 24, it says, When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they got into boats. They came to Capernaum seeking Jesus. And when they found him on the other side, he said, uh, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? And Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly, you seek me not because of the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you before. Because God the Father has set His seal on Him. 
Oftentimes when we pray over a meal, we ask the Lord to bless the food, and we also say, and bless us to your service. Have you ever said that? And bless us to, and thank you for the food and, and, and thank you for the abilities that you've given us that we might go out then and proclaim your word, to teach others, to help others, to serve you. Don't let it be an empty prayer. Engage someone in a life-giving gospel conversation. Let the meditation of your heart spill over into your relationships and glorify God as you speak. So as you prepare for the feast of thanksgiving, make sure it's a delicious spiritual feast. Not just a feeding of the cycle that will leave you looking for rolls and leftover ham in a few hours, but that it would be a spiritual feast that others in your family can come and enjoy. Feast on the love of God. Feast on the love of family. The special moment that will become a memory, a precious memories with people who you love. The opportunity to glorify God and lift a loved one out of the carnal rat race. Because you are what you eat. So eat the spiritual food God has prepared for you today. The spiritual enlightenment of the promise of salvation. I want to encourage you, if you're not a Christian, you are what you eat. Whatever you're taking in is what you're going to become. You're becoming whatever you're going to become right now. The choices that you're making today, the choices that you've made yesterday and that you'll make tomorrow, they'll make you into who you're going to be. So choose Jesus. You obey his gospel, his death, burial, and the resurrection. He says, he's choosing you. He's chosen you. And he wants you to be with him for all eternity. So submit to his way by hearing that gospel, by believing it, repenting of your sins, confessing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, being immersed for the remission of your sins. Just as Christ died and he was buried, you can be buried in a watery grave, baptism. And rise up out of that grave, just as Jesus did, to walk a new life, a Christian life. If you've done those things but you haven't been faithful, change. Repent whatever needs to be changed in your life and come back to Jesus right now as we stand and we sing this song. Yeah.